welcome to the third program in our series of Great Decisions, co-sponsored by the Mead Public Library and the Sheboygan Branch of the American Association of University Women, an organization dedicated to empowering women and girls and advancing equity through advocacy, education, and research. <clears throat> Because of the pandemic, we are presenting our sessions virtually and are grateful to WSCS for filming the six programs. <clears throat> a Great Decisions is a project of the Foreign Policy Association, which also publishes a book about the timely topics. We are not offering books for sale this year, but you can call 1-800-477-5836 to order one. That's 1-800-477-5836. 5836. As always, we are indebted to Mead librarian Jeannie Gartman for arranging the schedule for these programs. India and Pakistan is tonight's topic, presented by Peter Cranstover, retired from USAID. Peter Cranstover spent close to 30 years serving the U.S. government as a Foreign Service Officer with USAID in Washington, D.C., Latin America, Africa, and most recently, Pakistan. He is a political science graduate of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts, and has graduate degrees in economic development and agricultural economics from Oxford University and the University of Wisconsin, respectfully. A Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala, he spent his junior year of undergraduate study at the University of Madrid. He and his wife, who is Annie Lewandowski, who is an international development co consultant, have three children and live in Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Mr. Cranstover. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon at the Mead Library and to speak to you a bit here about uh, India and Pakistan, two of the uh, most important countries in the world, certainly um, the most, uh, a couple of the most populous, India being the uh, second most populous country in the world after China, and Pakistan just most recently being indicated as, as uh, the, the sixth most. Um, my name is Peter Cranstover, and I served with the federal government for uh, approximately 30 years as a commissioned foreign service officer with USAID, with the last assignment being in Pakistan a few years ago. I was reminded after agreeing to do something uh, for the Mead Library regarding these two countries that it's such an interesting and complicated and unusual story about both of these places. And what I've done is to presume to sum up some of the recent history from the region in about 20 slides, uh, which in no way does the, those countries or that particular history any kind of justice. So, and I'm reminded that when I came back to Wisconsin, where I was born and raised and, and uh, where I now live, that um, when people would ask me how it was, I'd seek to give them a little bit of a, uh, an academic lesson in, in those two places, but um, quickly discovered that it was easier just to say that Pakistan in particular was just really tense during my time there, but uh, an honor to serve there uh, certainly during that time. So I'm going to give you some early background on the area and then move quickly to the post-war World War II period, which is what we're most concerned about and which is perhaps a bit most germane, certainly to, to things that are going on at the moment in the world. Uh, an attempt to make sense of the historic tensions between India and Pakistan as it deals with both uh, populist and nationalist positions uh, on the part of current Prime Minister Narendra Modi and his BJP party and uh, Imran Khan, uh, both of whom have um, come to power just in the past few years. <laughs> so just to get us <clears throat> located, pretty basic political map indicating where we are, Pakistan and India, both in relatively tough neighborhoods, um, the crossroads of civilization. <clears throat> These are, um, this is a political map that shows you modern day boundaries, which in some ways, certainly with respect to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and indeed India are, are somewhat arbitrary. Um, they're there in, in one of the three places of uh, the birth of civilization, you know, the Indus Valley, um, and a geographic area that's been influenced and ruled over and, and um, 
lived in by Buddhists and Zoroastrians and Hindus, Muslims, Christians. Alexander the Great in, in 350, 360 B BC came through here. And uh, it was ultimately <clears throat> in the 14 or 1500s then invaded too by Central Asian uh, Mongols who um, through the uh, great leaders of Tamer, uh, Tamerlane and Babur and, and ultimately Akbar established a, uh, a rather interesting and, and functional empire there for three to 400 years. Um, the one that the British found and came to essentially um, uh, incorporate themselves with for commercial reasons um, in the early 1600s. The East India Company that the Brits established there in the early 1600s was a government incorporated, London incorporated stock company and commercial trading company that the British began in an effort to essentially um, rule that particular part of the world. And indeed, they, they did for quite some time through that somewhat quasi governmental organization. And that's what established them, them there really until 1947 when partition occurred, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But bookending that, that ancient period to the present day, we have, in, certainly in, in the lifetime of some of us in any case, uh, the two great leaders of, of the modern nation state, Ali Jinnah on the left there, who was the first prime minister of Pakistan, but only unfortunately for about 11 months. And of course, um, Mahatma Gandhi, who led the independence movement and whose cooperation ultimately, uh, along with the British envoy, uh, uh, Lord Mountbatten, resulted in the partition of the subcontinent into present day Pakistan and India, into what I should say was India and West Pakistan and East Pakistan, uh, East Pakistan now of course being Bangladesh. So just a couple of remarks regarding data on these places. I mentioned that Pakistan was the sixth largest country in the world and indeed it has a little over anywhere from 210 to 220 million people currently. India has got 1.35 billion uh, at the moment and um, with a couple of numbers here, you can see that um, their GDP growth has been quite healthy from 1990 to 2018. Pakistan had a growth rate of approximately 7% to 7.8% GDP growth rate over that, <clears throat> over that um, almost 30-year uh, period. Uh, India enjoyed a, a, a relatively uh, similar rate. Um, of uh, although although a little a little bit uh, uh, not quite as robust as Pakistan's of some 3.8 to 5.3 percent, and um, this has all been important because of the relatively fast population growth rate in in both of those countries the, and the fertility rates there. So you've got densely populated places um, with uh, relatively large elements of poverty that unfortunately have sort of harassed, if you will, the economic trajectory, economic growth trajectory of both of these places over the, uh, since their independence, certainly. Taking a look at um, the place that the British came upon in the 1600s, and by the way, the Portuguese got there a little bit before them with Vasco da Gama having uh, put down in present day Bombay. But the British came in and as you can see, there were various um, elements and um, political frameworks that they came across and, and certainly a number of different, uh, both Hindu and Muslim um, elements that, that the British had to deal with. And because of the fact that we, they didn't really confront a modern day nation state as we know it, the British essentially negotiated commercial agreements with any number of principalities and as we would say maharajas, to use a more common term, <clears throat> in order to do trading and to establish themselves there. And since there wasn't really a centrally functioning and particularly strong central government at that time, 
they really were able to sort of have their way, particularly in the areas of Bombay and Calcutta uh, and, um, and in, uh, around um, Pondicherry there in the, uh, what is the southeast. And they were able to do this and uh, um, get along for the most part, at least in a commercial manner, with the local inhabitants um, who for the most part were uh, essentially their, their workers, their servants, their, um, their bankers in some instances, certainly their, their producers of all kinds of elements and uh, minerals and, and natural resources that the British were able to take back to, um, back to, uh, back to Great Britain. Um, the crown and the jewel, right? Uh, the jewel and the crown, rather, for, uh, as we say, in the, uh, um, which ultimately was uh, given to uh, Queen Victoria by the Indians. Today you've got this, at least a uh, modern day political map here, of uh, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh since 1971, I should say. Now from 47 to 71, Bangladesh was known as East Pakistan. That's how it was partitioned. <clears throat> That's how it was established. Uh, and for some reason, um, reflecting uh, the desires of, of both Jenna and Gandhi, although after some rather strenuous negotiations, everybody agreed that having a, a country of East Pakistan and West Pakistan, despite its separation by some 1,000 miles, was the way to go in order to get partition. So um, as unusual as that type of arrangement was, it did happen to reflect the fact that the British were breaking up their empire. It was right after World War II. The British weren't particularly interested in maintaining their uh, presence there, at least as colonial administrators. And uh, not only that, but communal riots, you know, between or amongst a number of different groups, in particular, of course, the Hindus and the Muslims, had begun, uh, had, had been breaking out actually decades before over the years and getting increasingly, increasingly difficult. So, uh, <clears throat> at the moment now, we have Mr. Modi in power in India, been in since May of 2014 as prime minister, and he's only the second prime minister in India who has actually served a full term as a, uh, a representative of the BJP or the Hindu uh, Nationalist Party. And really the first one of the BJP um, which has uh, who has actually succeeded himself and is in his second term uh, as, as uh, head of that party. Now, the BJP was formed in 1951, although it grows out of something called the uh, National Auxiliary um, Society of Hindu Nationalists, which formed way back in the, 19, in the 1920s, and or a national volunteer organization, <clears throat> which was sort of a, a nationalist militia arm that was rather anti-British and was interested certainly in, in establishing itself as an influential Hindu group and um, wanted uh, independence, as did influential Muslim groups, of course, during that time. Um, Modi is, um, has been here to the United States. He was here in 2019. He represents a, um, at least um, with respect to his overall party platform, a somewhat um, inward-looking kind of uh, uh, politics. Um, he and his party reacted initially against the Congress party, which was, has been the, really the predominant political party in India since, since, the, uh, since partition in 47, um, beginning with the Prime Minister Nehru, whom the BJP, Hindu nationalists, always thought had somehow accommodated or been a little soft on the Muslims, who, by the way, make up about 15% of that 1.35 billion people in India at the moment, um, which comes out, if I do my math right, to a little over 200 million people uh, in the subcontinent there in India. Um, so he and his people do represent um, 
a populist, slightly uh, right-wing, certainly nationalist um, position, ideological position uh, regarding their uh, management and, and political um, um, ideology in terms of how they're running India. We've had ups and downs with the Indians. Certainly uh, in the 50s, Nehru tilted a little bit towards the Russians. Pakistan always tilted a little bit towards the Chinese. Nehru appreciated the Russian economic model, believe it or not, at least in terms of big public sector institutions and economic planning. He um, was uh, concerned nonetheless enough by um, by uh, the Russians as well as the Chinese that he actually came to Washington and visited with uh, Kennedy. And he, in the early 60s, he asks Kennedy for some air defense assistance. There was a Chinese-Indian War in 1962 and a couple afterwards. Um, and Kennedy agrees. And military hardware, intelligence sharing occurs during that time. And as some of our economists in the State Department had seen at that time, there was really a need for some economic development. So a relatively large economic development program begins to get uh, moving there in, in, uh, in, uh, in India. Something called Public Law 480 comes in, which is our grain export program that Eisenhower put into effect in 1954. <clears throat> we also asked, you know, and, and made negotiations at that time, certainly with India and Pakistan, uh, so that they would basically get along. <laughs> they, India and Pakistan didn't necessarily see it that way. They were particularly interested in having decent relationships with us. But the existential question for both of these countries is, what is my neighbor, i.e. Uh, either Pakistan or India, going to do? And this is a reflection of um, some problems, of course, that occurred during partition. And Partition comes about, as I had mentioned earlier, in 1947. Um, and let me just jump here to um, show a quick piece here of current day Pakistan. But I wanted to get on to our current prime minister there, Imran Khan. Um, and is a reflection of the kinds of things that keep Khan and Modi looking at each other in a relatively suspicious manner. Uh, they have met nonetheless and keep communications open. Um, Khan, unlike Modi, who comes from a relatively humble background, is, he was a tea seller actually, Modi, when he was eight or nine years old in the, um, at the train station with his father and worked his, his way up through the uh, uh, party structure. Khan is from a relatively prosperous family in Lahore, the old, the uh, ancient um, capital of, of the subcontinent. Went to Oxford um, and uh, married a, a, an interesting and, and well-connected um, British-French woman by the name of uh, Jemima Goldsmith. And um, also to his uh, adoring fans in any case was a, world-class cricketer and brought the World Cup of cricket to, to Pakistan in, in 92, if I remember correctly. But both of these fellows uh, are, are extremely aware of their early history and the partition elements that were implemented in ultimately and unfortunately in a relatively violent way. And it was done, as I said, as mentioned earlier, in 47, but in a relatively quick way and during that summer. And it was because of not only those communal riots that I had mentioned earlier, but also because of the fact that the British were basically tired of trying to maintain a lot of these overseas colonies. India and Pakistan are still members of the Commonwealth nonetheless. But <clears throat> the British government sent Lord Mountbatten, shown here, who's a, a member of the royal family, to Delhi, the New Delhi, to basically negotiate between Jenna and, and, and Gandhi, who you saw earlier. And he had about six or seven weeks, and that was it. 
Now, he had served there before. He had been there before. But he brought along a fellow uh, a sound public servant <clears throat> by the name of uh, Radcliffe, who was a lawyer, never been to India before. And Mountbatten gave him some maps and a desk and things like this at the at governance house there in, uh, in Delhi and said, you've got to basically give me a border here. And so Radcliffe sat down and he drew that border between present day India and Pakistan. Uh, with really no appreciation of the kind of line that he was drawing. You can see the line that, that uh, separates Pakistan and India. Well, it happens to go through some of the most fertile farmland in the world there, certainly in the subcontinent, right through the Punjab. There's Punjab in Pakistan. There's also Punjab in India. And also looked over to the east there and decided that, and by the way, Pakistan and, and uh, Bangladesh were certainly Muslim majority places. And he put those lines in and presented those to uh, Mountbatten. And as tensions were rising, uh, Mountbatten accepted this. And he said he wanted to get this taken care of. And we wound up with Pakistan, and we wound up with with India, let me get this back here, in, in, our present, in our present formulation. Well, that was all right, except for the fact that people panicked. Muslims in India went west, and Hindus in uh, in Pakistan went east. And panic and sectarian rivalries and efforts basically to loot other places took place over that period of time in 1947, August to say December of 47. And a lot of uh, perhaps a million people lost their lives in that particular, uh, in, in that particular time frame, trying to get to what both parties happen to believe were safer, were safer areas. So all of this is a result of decades of tensions, a rising consciousness on the part of Muslims that they want, that they really need their particular um, their own state by Hindus who aren't particularly interested in, in uh, their Muslim conquerors, if you will, going all the way back to the Mughals, although it was a tolerant and very sin and, and, uh, uh, prosperous sort of, particularly under Akbar empire, a syncretic um, population of different um, religions and, and races. Um, but panic sort of set in at that time in 47. Pakistan gets about 23% of the subcontinent and no industry really to speak of. And cotton from the West, which had supplied Indian mills, uh, now are unable to be exported. Pakistan never gets what it was promised in terms of war material. And that's not to be unexpected because of the fact that the Indians and the Pakistanis immediately began to, to fight with each other. Well, here's sort of what is a little bit of a, a shot on, on what happens then. You've got this, you've got current population, current GDP, and you have that war in 47 with Pakistan and India, 65 also in 1971 and in 1999. You have the Chinese and the Indians fighting in 62. And then some of the notes here on, on Pakistan and its, its population, its GDP. And most importantly here, perhaps, 
this civil war of 71, which begins in, in the, in, because of elections that East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh, had at that time. They had more population than West Pakistan at the moment, and they basically won enough in order to form a government. Well, the government then in power, in uh, with a fellow by the name of Yahya Khan, and his foreign minister, Zulfikar Bhutto, whose daughter eventually became prime minister in the late 80s and then once again in the early um, and mid 90s and who unfortunately was assassinated in, in 07, uh, pushed very much to have the Pakistani army go into uh, East Pakistan and take over, despite the fact that the East Pakistanis had voted for um, uh, a different party and were insisting upon having a, uh, forming the government. Well, the Pakistanis went in, the Pakistani army went in at that point and started to uh, really um, engage in some awful behavior, a genocide as some of our diplomats in Dhaka at the moment said it in something called the blood telegram, which <clears throat> was sent to Washington saying, look, you've got to use your executive power here. And this was to Kissinger and to Nixon saying, tell the Pakistanis to, to back off. Some, uh, the, the Nixon administration ignored this, tilted towards Pakistan in this regard. The Indians right next door see what's going on and send their troops into, into Bangladesh and ultimately about 10 million Bengalis take refuge in, in India. Some 300,000 to some 3 million estimated deaths occur in Bangladesh during this time. And even up to 2016, 2017, the Bangladeshis have tried and, and even executed some pro-Pakistani, pro-Islamabad uh, imams who they believe were instrumental in uh, helping the Pakistani army during that period in 1971. So this essentially leads Bhutto, who eventually becomes prime minister then in the 70s, Zulfikar Bhutto. This loss of East Pakistan that now becomes Bangladesh <clears throat> to decide that he really needs to get nuclear weapons. And indeed, in 1965, he said to an American journalist that we don't have nuclear weapons yet, but we probably need to get them. And if we get them, we'll go so, so far as to sacrifice such that we'll eat grass or we'll buy them from somebody. Well, it's a long story and, and one that's pretty well documented. But they eventually, in 1998, proved to the world that they have some nuclear weapons. 1974, the Indians had their tests, smiling Buddha nuclear tests, as they called them. And they were able to, um, uh, the Pakistanis were able to, through um, their own scientists, and particularly a fellow by the name of A.Q. Khan, who had worked in the Netherlands for many years, to get nuclear technology. And also, um, and he came back to, the, to India then, um, afterwards, along with stolen plans on centrifuges and nuclear technology. And he also made connections both with the Libyans and the North Koreans and the Iranians in order to get nuclear technology and, and ultimately plutonium. So now both of these countries, hugely populated, extremely large, <clears throat> rivals in all types of manners are there in the subcontinent and fortunately continue to talk but do have this uh, fractious history and are constantly eyeing each other in a very wary manner. Now, a couple of things exacerbate this relationship. Not only the nuclear power and, and uh, the nuclear deterrence aspect that both of these countries have, <coughs> But also, their relations with China, Afghanistan, issues regarding water, Kashmir, and 
as I mentioned earlier, nuclear powers. I'm going back here because I just want you to <coughs> see the fractiousness of, of India before partition and the, the dark green being Muslim majority areas and light green being mostly Muslim areas and the red being Hindu and uh, the gray and the, uh, and the yellow uh, being a mix of different, of different uh, religions and sects. Now at the top of that particular one, you'll see a, a slightly um, tan colored province and that's Kashmir. Now Kashmir is to the Indians and the Pakistanis as um, perhaps Bosnia was to the Serbians, you know, in, in, at the turn of the century in the 1900s or to um, Irish Republicans in, in Ireland, as Northern Ireland is to Irish Republicans. It's a province and a, a princely state that like some of the 500 others that Mountbatten confronted when he was trying to negotiate with everybody on partition, <clears throat> didn't know where it was going to go. It was ruled by a slightly dissolute Hindu prince who ruled over a majority Muslim population. And this fellow was the last guy that Mountbatten was trying to negotiate with and he was very frustrated by it and he said to him, they shared an interest in trout fishing, interestingly enough, in, in, in Kashmir. Mountbatten said to him, I would appreciate it, you know, let's meet tomorrow, I'll think about it, you know. Tell me which way you wanna go, are you gonna go with Pakistan or are you gonna go with India? and we'll meet tomorrow and, and go trout fishing. Well, the guy never showed up for his trout fishing date with Mountbatten. And as they say, the rest is history. Mountbatten apparently never talked to him again, but it left the issue of which way that country was, or that principality, if you will, was going to go <clears throat> for you and I to basically take care of or to be concerned about or to worry about. And why do I say that? Well, here's, a little bit, here's Kashmir, right? Now, the yellow part there is claimed by China. The purple part there is claimed by India. The green part is claimed by Pakistan. And that's how it currently is at the moment. Most importantly, Pakistan, which has an agricultural sector for that large population is dependent on water of the Indus River, but also from the five rivers that start in Kashmir or just above it, that are vital not only for their agriculture, but also for their hydropower. So as one of the former intelligence heads of the Pakistani government said, a fellow by the name of Sud, <coughs> Kashmir isn't about land, it isn't about irredentism, it isn't about anything like that, it's about water. That's what we're concerned about. And so since 88 really, when an insurgency began in Kashmir <clears throat> and some 50 to 100,000 civilians and security people have been killed, uh, nothing really has um, ameliorated this situation. One might say because of a, a guy couldn't show up for his trout fishing date with uh, Mountbatten not to disparage this or to make light of it because it's a really uh, uh, an, an extremely fundamental problem. <clears throat> and the Chinese, as, I, as you can see by this map, are interested in one section there. So much so that just this past spring, the Chinese and the Indians went at it again, although this time not necessarily with guns or anything, but with clubs and rocks and things like this over that particularly disputed area. Now this is an area, you know, in that in, in that part of the world, which is 12,000 to 20,000 feet high, but it's the source of all of this water for the Indus Valley, part of which India has and part of which Pakistan has and is reflected in a regular, um, regularly amended and negotiated water rights um, uh, treaty that both of these countries have. So China, couple of wars with India, water, Kashmir, nuclear issues. And just to wind up here, and not to, again, diminish this particular element, but Afghanistan, which 
borders both India and Pakistan, which both of them see as being part of their near abroad or their particular country of influence, and which has essentially, since the king was overthrown and the Russians came in in 1979, hasn't seen any peace. Strategically, from the Americans' point of view, we went in to Pakistan and with hundreds of millions of dollars every year and essentially going through the CIA with the help, and with the help of the, certainly the Pakistani army and the Pakistani intelligence services, moved armaments and training and all kinds of things, food to the Afghani Mujahideen or the, the Afghani freedom fighters who, the nationalists who eventually morphed into a number of different factions including the Taliban in order to push back on the Soviets. As the Pakistanis and the Afghanis will tell you, <coughs> they won the Cold War because they basically defeated the Russians there with all of our armaments, of course. We channeled them through Saudi Arabia. William Casey was Reagan's uh, CIA chief at the time and he was very much concerned about this and took a very hands-on approach to do this. The fellow that they dealt with there was a fellow by the name of, um, uh, was a dictator who came in in 78, I believe, um, and uh, Al-Haq, and he um, became uh, quite a, uh, a Muslim fundamentalist, a rather austere um, dictator, and allowed uh, a lot of the, um, certainly allowed the Mujahideen to come in and out of, of uh, Pakistan and encouraged his ISI, as they call the intelligence services there in Pakistan, <clears throat> to assist the Afghanis. Part of this is a reflection of the fact that having lost West Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh in 1971, the Pakistanis will tell you that Afghanistan, not only is, uh, is there an ethnic uh, and historical connection there, but it's a place that if indeed, God forbid, an awful war breaks out between India and Pakistan, the Pakistanis can move to, they can retreat to. And these are the kinds of strategic things, you know, that the Pakistani planners and military guys um, think about. And so that connection prevails to this day. And um, even after we stopped that program in, in 88, 89, uh, but it, it's one that um, has established the importance, certainly in the Pakistanis' eyes, of their ability to, to influence real-world events uh, from a strategic standpoint. So you have these two terribly interesting and ancient places of very capable people and uh, in, in, unfortunately, very tense standoffs with almost existential issues of their relationships with their neighbors, something as fundamental as water, certainly Kashmir, which just doesn't seem to be getting any better. Certainly under the Modi government, he's gone in there and he's basically moved his troops in there and he's decided not to allow Pakistan, or Kashmir to have any type of special status, which it has enjoyed. And of course, the fact that they both happen to be very well armed and um, extremely well financed, uh, particularly the Indian Army. So I will leave you with that. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. There's a, t a ton of material here that, that um, we could certainly go over. I would commend to you, um, these are a couple of pictures uh, up along the uh, Pakistan, near the Pakistan-Afghan border that uh, a friend of mine and I took um, a few years ago with just some, here's a Pashtun fellow who is like Imran Khan uh, from that particular part of the world. Um, but I, I would commend to you a, a few books here, <clears throat> particularly Pakistan, a hard country, which lays out all of the subject areas really that I mentioned here. Pakistan, Eye of the Storm, a little bit easier to get through. The Great Game, which is a great piece. Hopkirk's an old British journalist who um, wrote a book about that particular area, mostly Afghanistan and, and present-day Pakistan. And of course, takes his title from the uh, Kipling poem about the, the Great Game. 
A New History of India by Stanley Walper is a little dated, but nonetheless extremely, extremely fine. And uh, another great piece, a little more recent, maybe in the past 10 years, called The Last Mogul by William Dalrymple. And he talks about the Indian Mutiny of 1857, or as my Pakistani friends would tell me, the first war of Indian independence. Right? Uh, and how the British essentially then crushed that mutiny, crushed that war of independence, and put in direct rule from 1857 to essentially 1947. <clears throat> putting in courts, putting in their laws, putting in essentially a British education structure there, um, ultimately leading, of course, to, to partition in 47. But that's a wonderful read, and it's based on um, subcontinent uh, Indian and Pakistani uh, documentation as opposed to um, British uh, reports and things like that from that particular era. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Once again, it's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mr. Cranstover. And we hope you will turn in next week when the topic will be China's Road into Latin America. Thank you.